Thank you very much. Um, uh, what I will present you today is really the beginning of a f larger field work. So it's a kind of some first preliminary observation I want to share with you with what I seen during my last field work in Ukraine. And <clears throat> of course, um, I will give no answers, only questions, because what was raised by this, this preliminary field work is uh, a lot of questions. Um, I worked on uh, Afghanistan veterans, the, re the veterans, not, not Afghans, but Ukrainians who took part in the Soviet war in Afghanistan uh, in uh, the 80s, the 1980s, uh, and who live in Ukraine right now. The, my research was uh, in two parts. Um, but actually, uh, well, um, yeah. Um, what are we talking about? Um, the Ukrainian veterans of the Soviet war in Afghanistan were conscripts as well as officers involved in the Soviet armed actions in Afghanistan between 1979 and 1989. 160,000 Ukrainians, more than 3,000 killed, according to official data, and 8,000 uh, 8, injured. Uh, today we have around 150,000 uh, uh, veterans living uh, in Ukraine. We have this common history shared with uh, all other post-Soviet countries of a difficult return to civil life, post-traumatic syndrome, uh, non-treated by the Soviet state, uh, some difficulties to regain a social status, and also what we have in Ukraine which what, what we don't necessarily have in all the post-Soviet countries, is a very strong, structured network of uh, veterans' movements uh, all around Ukraine, quite centralized with some dissident organization, but quite organized and involving most of these uh, 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 veterans. Uh, and actually, I presented a few years ago uh, an account of this uh, of research on this uh, on this organization at the new seminar. Um, my field work was in two parts. First part, 2010-2011, when I worked on this, these uh, veterans' organizations. And what I observed was basically that. Uh, a commem commemorative movement, uh, a brotherhood network, uh, very linked to uh, Russia and other post-Soviet countries, with people... Um, very concerned about the, the past as combatants, non-volunteer combatants in Afghanistan, but it was a kind of, you know, a memorial thing. Most of those I interviewed were uh, quite well integrated, and some, some of them very well integrated in the civil life. They were employees uh, or managers or uh, intellectual workers or whole businesses and were quite I, I didn't see I didn't see many disadvantage, disadvantaged uh, veterans in my first field work. Uh, also because it was, uh, it, uh, I, I interviewed mostly people in, in inside the organization and the organization's network, so they were people that could have adapted. Maybe the others were. You, we, of course, we have different situations, but basically, we, basically, what I observed was a, a, a good integration in the civil life and a nostalgia, a nostalgia of this youth, of this war experience, um, transmitting, transmitted in commemoration in, in this kind of events like song contests and festivals and meetings uh, in, in Russia, in Central Asia, sometimes in Ukraine, of an international um, field work. When I was back to my field work in 2015, uh, the picture is in 2014, but uh, my field work was in 2015 in, uh, with the veterans. Uh, it was um, in a framework on a very different project. I was, I, I was supposed to um, make interviews, um, collect testimonies of Afghanistan veterans all over the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union. It's a, it was a part of a collective project. But in Ukraine, it happened that all my in, uh, respondents were very actively involved in the armed conflict in Donbass. And of course, the research dr dramatically changed, and uh, a large part of the interviews was on this kind of, also on the mix of the war experience, or the past war experience, and on the present war experience. What I observed is a militarization of these people, but 
a kind of um, specific militarization, I, and I will go more in depth in, in, in this. Um, I will, uh, my presentation will be in three parts. First, what does it mean being back to war after 20 years of peace? Second, what happened to this brotherhood of soldiers that they claim to be so strong when the brotherhood is split in two by the front line? And third question, what about Soviet values? And this is a kind of continuation of a discussion we had with Mikhail Levinsky a few time ago. Soviet values that uh, seem to be very strong among these Afghanistan veterans. First part, being back to war after 20 years of peace. The pictures, uh, the anonymized pictures are from the veterans' uh, personal archives. The other ones are, are, are taken from open sources. Um, most of my interviewees, uh, except one, uh, were very active in, in, in Maidan and in the Afghanska Sotnya, the Afghan battalion, in, in, uh, on Maidan. And then, very naturally, there was not, not a kind of... Um, the transition was invisible to them, I, I would say, switched from Maidan to the volunteer battalions. It was a logic continuation, so most of them fo found themselves in uh, Aydar battalion. This is a picture taken in uh, summer 2014. Most of my, uh, my uh, respondents were then in the Af Afghanska rota of the, uh, of the Aydar battalion with a kind of great enthusiasm not enthusiasm, I wouldn't say that, but a kind of commitment uh, that were, was very um, visible. Uh, one of my uh, respondents uh, tells, um, tells about this adrenaline they had during the, the, the first weeks. I've lost 15 kilograms in a few weeks. I was like a 24-year-old. I got six-pack abs. I was jumping on the armored vehicle like a youngster. And then suddenly it stopped. All this energy was adrenaline. I've been leaning on adrenaline for three weeks. Others also find themselves remembering the previous war they had. Five minutes left. Oh, no, this is so cruel. Uh, yeah. Um, one of my respondents told me I, I was there uh, in a vehicle in Donbass, and then I had this the recollection of that smell, it was the same smell of metal and dust they have in, in, in Afghanistan. So fighting at the age of 50 was not easy for them. And most of them retired from the, from the front line, but still were and are actively involved in, uh, in the war. I'm not sure we can, what we, what we observe here is the reactivation of violent so socialization. My observation is that these people were civilians. At the moment, they started they were experienced. They were they were definitely back to civil life, so, and and but but um, what we observe, the way we observe them is I mean, what 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 I see in in my field work is that they feel exactly the same as the same non-Afghan veterans combatants on the front line. <coughs> the the war made them reconsider the Afghanistan experience. One of my respondents said, when we were under shelling for the first time in August, a Russian shelling, we, the Afghans, the Afghanistan veterans, had the same understanding at the same moment. We were playing the Mujahideen's role here, coming with a rifle and receiving in return our, in artillery fire so strong that you can't do anything. We felt like them when we, the tanks attacked. That's why I have compassion for the Afghans. We shouldn't have gone there. I understood that a long time ago. And this is something I heard from many of them. <coughs> this... Uh, um, a step back from the front line resulted in a huge diversity and fluidity of forms of involvement. We have, among my respondents, uh, regular fighters, but less and less regular fighters because you know, old wounds uh, start to, to, to make things different. I, we have lots of occasional fighters, lots. We have occasional fighters, those who go to, to fight during their work holidays and then are back to the civil life. We have uh, uh, battalion supply uh, groups which go on weekends supplying battalions with provision and different things. We have uh, people providing training, people financing training, and people morally supporting as one of my respondents who is a singer. So different and fluid forms of involvement. What I show here is that there is a huge diversity of, of, of uh, I'm, for the same person, the huge diversity of ways of being involved. There's no 
strict separation, and this is about the volunteer battalions, no strict separation between volunteering and fighting. All things are fluid. The guy here, you know, he's coming with a, uh, a supply mission, as you can see from the bottles of water and boxes, but still uh, carrying a rifle, right? Because during his, his stay uh, with the battalion, he was there fighting. Of course, this is 2014, since the battalions were more institutionalized, things change a little bit. Two minutes, perfect. What happened to this brotherhood of soldiers that appeared very strong? When they first told me that we have a, such a strong uh, brotherhood of soldiers in 2010, I was thinking, come on. Everybody says that, we are strong, we are the best, we are friends forever, nothing can split, split us as two. Actually, there, was, there, there is something very interesting about it. We had a violent split between Ukrainian and Russian Afghansi. What I have here is a quotation by Franz Klintsevich, who is the leader of the Russian Organization of Veterans, uh, an MP in the Russian parliament, extremely an, an anti-Ukrainian and extremely supportive of Putin. And my respondents were just, how can, could he do that? He's a traitor. Right. So, but on a, ba on, a, um, on a field level, on the, on the level of, 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 of the everyday relationship, the situation is quite different. Across the front line, we have a strong friend, uh, friendship ties. All of my respondents know people on the other side of the front line fighting for the pro-Russian separatists. And some of them are, are, still, are still friends. One of my respondents tell, tell, um, tells, um, quoting, um, mentioning his friend on the other side of, of the front line. We have an arrangement. If one of us see the other's military union, first we do a phone call and then we shoot. We agreed to always keep in touch. And when I move, I always make a call. Where are you? I'm moving this way. You understand? He understands and doesn't open fire. The link is still here. The Brotherhood is still there to secure prisoners exchange and bodies transfer. What my, one of my respondents who took part in a, in a prisoners exchange told me that the, um, the exchanges secured by the the Afghanistan veterans are the strongest. Our contacts are the most stable. We trust each other because we have already had a war in our lives. It's maybe not very nice to look at. We arrive from each side of the front line. We hug each other. We shake each other's hand. We exchange our prisoners and we go away. Maybe some people would be shocked because we look like, <clears throat> but if these kind of things didn't exist, it would have been a nightmare. So this is, uh, this, uh, this, makes us imagine what their reconciliation could be and the role of this kind of communities, which is not, all, it's not specific to Afghans, I think. It's strong in Afghans' case, but it's not specific. As for the Soviet values, I stopped here. Uh, and I, I, get, I hope we'll have questions about that during the discussion. Uh, but just in one word, in one, Soviet values were presented as a kind of explanation of the split between Donbas and the rest of the country. Afghansi are seen, and there's a part of truth in that, to be the most strong carriers of Soviet values in Ukrainian society. And actually, they split in two. And I have huge examples of, I mean, very impressive examples of veterans still strong in um, carrying strong Soviet values on the pro-Ukrainian side. And I'll be happy to go on in the discussion and go more in depth. <laughs>